Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our second in our seminar series on uh, post-2025 market design. Uh, this is a series of webinars that have been put together by the Monash Business School's Australian Energy Market Initiative, jointly with the Australian Energy Market Operator, the Energy Security Board, and the Monash Energy Institute. Uh, but before we get started, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our four Australian campuses stand and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today we have an exciting seminar on uh, the role of storage in the grid and I will hand it over to Guillaume Rocher to introduce the speaker. Guillaume. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. All right, good morning all. Thank you, Simon. And thank you to uh, Omer Karaguman for addressing us today. Uh, it's morning in Australia, Omer is actually sitting in Turkey, it's uh, midnight where he is uh, sitting at the moment. Omer is a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford. His research interests are market design and the transition of the economy to a decarbonized future. Concretely, that means that he developed an expertise in the economics of grayscale storage and uses both game theoretic foundations and data to conduct his work. In particular, of interest to us, he uses data from South Australia on storage and on wind-based generation. Uh, Omer received his PhD recently from MIT under the guidance of the others of Paul Josko, whom we know. Uh, while he's a very young academic, still Omer's contributions are pathbreaking, I believe, and very much relevant to the current reform agenda in Australia, which is why he's uh, been asked to address us today. And with this, I transition immediately to Omer. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you very much for a, a generous introduction. Let me share my screen. Right. Hopefully, you can see my slides. Perfect. Okay, um, today I will talk about economics of grid scale energy storage. I, as Guillaume said, I've been working on uh, South Australian markets uh, for uh, three years now. And uh, today I will not just talk about my paper, but also talk about the general need for energy storage. And I will, after, my, after presenting my paper, I will talk about a simple exercise for NIM about the possible need for energy storage uh, in the short run and the long run uh, to kind of deal with the renewable intermittencies and uh, variation in production. Then I will talk a little bit about the level, the playing field for energy storage and what has been done or what, is, what needs to be done in NIM. And I think some of these policy changes are already in play. And then I will talk about some ongoing energy storage projects that I have that could be related with the, with the policy changes that's happening in AMO uh, as well. So what is energy storage? It's basically, uh, and why do we need it? It's to, to kind of motivate that, we need to take a couple of steps back and think about the producing clean electricity, which is, uh, it's been key for decarbonization and fight with climate change as the sector accounts for one fourth of, of overall CO2 emissions in the world and in the Austra in Australia, it's even more than that. And going forward, we're also planning to switch almost all of our energy needs into the electricity, like tra transition, uh, transportation and heating. So producing clean electricity is going to be even more important. And the way that we are trying to make that happen now is by subsidizing renewables. But as you all know, renewables are intermediate and not dispatchable. And because of the nature of electricity, that intermediacy and change in the demand side is changing the supply side it kind of creates some imbalance. And in the absence of energy storage, the way that we maintain that balance is basically using inefficient and high carbon emitter units. So energy storage is basically makes electricity more durable. It's a capture of energy produced at one time for user at a later time. And in electricity markets, energy storage can provide many goods, many, uh, many services. Uh, for instance, it, it can provide ancillary services, which, is the, which has been the main use for many energy storages uh, in Australia and different parts of the US and in, the, in, the, in Europe. Uh, but it'll, it can also engage, with, engage in price arbitrage in time, which is going to be the main focus of my paper. And I believe 
going forward, this is going to be the main revenue stream for energy storage because ancillary services and different type of products are kind of a smaller in the size of, in terms of the size of revenue uh, compared to the energy markets. It can contribute to reliability in different ways. It can provide some transmission relief, which I'm going to talk about in my ongoing projects. Uh, so energy storage can uh, help with the transmission relief uh, if there is transmission constraints that are not consistently binding. And all of, after all, it can also help in the future to deal with cur uh, the curtailment to this uh, renewables change in availability, especially between seasons. <clears throat> so the, the thing that makes energy storage a little bit different and also think that makes our head scratch a little bit more about how to uh, support renewables, it, how to support energy storage is basically the, this different nature of costs for energy storage. The opportunity cost of producing electricity is the price of electricity at the time of charging, which makes energy storage a dynamic uh, entity that solves a dynamic problem. So there are different levels of markets for energy storage to, to be used. There's a household level. Households can have a home energy storage systems or EVs that can help to decrease the rooftop solar PV waste if there, is a, if there is any. That can provide a little bit of resilience, but it, excuse me, it also depends on the infrastructure that you have. And it can also help with the congestion and line losses at the distribution side. But overall, energy storage, home energy storage levels, similar to the rooftop solar PV, it's usually, usually not economical compared to the grid scale or big scale versions of these technologies. And at community level, it can help similarly with the congestion and line loss of the distribution. We can, use, we, we can use energy storage in the portfolio of EPPs, which can help further down to, to, to have participation from the uh, DREs. Also, we, we can have actual physical DRE aggregators, aggregators that can uh, actually uh, buy back uh, electricity from the households and put that back into the grid. But that also requires, uh, that also requires a lot of infrastructure improvement on the grid or also on the distribution. But the grid scale is basically going to be the today's focus. So the, the most important reason why energy storage is now in the play uh, it's one of the reasons is the renewables, but the, maybe the, the, the better reason is the cost, uh, cost story. So costs are going down across the board for different type of chemicals as well. So we have uh, uh, old pump hydro uh, energy storage utilities, uh, utility scales here that cost didn't change much. So it's actually kind of cheap to have pump hydro, but not everyone is lucky in terms of physical space to have such such system, which also cannot adjust its production very fast compared to the lithium ion batteries, for instance. But we're hoping that as we produce more of these uh, technologies, energy storage technologies, the costs are going to go down even more. Uh, there's, there's no winner here, at least for now. So we are basically trying to uh, bet pretty much all of them and try to get at least a little bit of each to, to see which one is going to help us uh, more in the future with the, with the more renewables. So today I will talk a little bit more about lithium ion batteries. It's the, 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 the biggest uh, news in uh, energy storage uh, literature. Uh, the, the main reason is, is again, it's decreasing costs. So costs decreased by 70%, almost 80% in the last decade. So this, these are cell costs. Uh, lithium ion cell cost. So in order to make this utility scale, you need to uh, pay a little bit more. Uh, they're great with dealing with intermediacy because they can provide very fast adjustments. And in terms of location, they are flexible. They're not like pump hydro. No significant grid expansion is required. There are lots of incentive programs that I'm not going to talk about, but there is an ownership discussion going on, like who should own an energy storage. If we have subsidy programs, who should we prioritize? Uh, in Excuse me. In the U.S., it's been an ongoing debate. So in California, for instance, utilities have some type of mandates to have an energy storage, but in ERCOT, utilities are not allowed to own an energy storage. So this is an ongoing discussion going on. Um, and in AMO, this is just a table that I 
put uh, that I took out from uh, Nim's website. It's in Australia. There are uh, 25 gigawatt hour of solar is proposed, 18 gigawatt of wind. I know that most of these are not going to be realized, but still, this is a very ambitious expansion. And in terms of storage, it's 6.5 gigawatts. So that's a, a very, very impressive number, and uh, hopefully that will happen. But uh, we still, if you, if you have all of these played in the market, the pricing of the system is probably going to be a little bit fluke, and we need to think a little bit more about maybe you know, reliance and uh, like all of these post 2025 is probably mostly uh, motivated by, by this transition and all of the world is actually like Australia is, is kind of a star in this transitioning market and people hopefully will get some lessons from Australian experience. Um, so today I will, as I said, focus on, for my paper, I will focus on arbitrage of an energy storage. So in order to uh, engage in arbitrage, there needs to be a variance, a variance in the prices. Energy storage needs to buy when the prices are low and sell when the prices are high. And while doing that, it will make money if there's a price variance, but also it will change the social returns. Uh, how? It's through a change in prices, first of all. If, by buying low and selling high, it will smooth prices and there will be a transfer between consumers, producer surplus. Uh, if there is a market power of incumbent firms, which is usually the case in electricity markets, energy source can help to mitigate that as well. And it can provide also an efficiency, change in efficiency of production by changing the cost of electricity production in time. So by shifting electricity in time, it can uh, lower the overall cost of the system and while doing that, it can also lower the overall CO2 emissions and decrease the renewable curtailment if there's any. And these changes are particularly significant if energy storage is large, which is the, 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 the grid scale part is, is mostly about. So my research question for this paper was, are incentives for investing and operating an energy storage in a whole electric market socially efficient or not? So related questions with that, is it wealthy or improving? have an energy storage in the system and do the prices create right incentives to operate an energy storage and related to that who should own an energy storage then like if the prices are uh, like if, if there if there any difference in terms of the operational uh, and deployment of energy storage under different uh, ownership structures if you want to subsidize someone who should be subsidized so that's a sort of a related questions that comes up with the, with this main question so build up a dynamic equilibrium framework to quantify a hypothetical energy storage impact by allowing storage's uncertainty uh, and allow for incumbent firms' response to energy storage. And then I endogenize energy storage's price impact. So basically, energy storage is going to buy when the price is low, it's going to increase prices. And when it's going to sell when the prices are high, it's going to decrease prices. So if you assume that there is no price impact and if the energy storage is large, you're basically going to overestimate energy storage's revenue, energy storage's profit from the arbitrage. Uh, so this is not a very easy task. So there are two technical challenges to that. First of all, energy storage's problem is dynamic. So how much electricity energy you have in your battery is going to dictate how much you can deploy in the future. So that is making energy storage problem dynamic, which is very different than the existing power plants. And since in electric market, uh, firms are submitting their willingness to produce as supply functions, the equilibrium concept that we use here is supply function equilibrium. So this multi-unit auction is cleared by the supply function equilibrium prices. And calculating this needed equilibrium is usually hard, so sometimes it doesn't exist. Uh, so the way that I you know, circumvent that is I use estimated best response to observed variation in demand volatility. What I mean by that is, if your data set is rich enough, if we have some days where prices are smoother than the others, then I can try to imitate the firm's best responses to energy storage entry by looking at the strategies of the firms. In that case, it's a best response to energy storage in the other case. So I will go over this uh, uh, method in the, uh, further uh, down the slides. But just to give you an idea, this is how I calculated it. And then I simulate a grid scale energy storage in South Australia. Not surprisingly, 
it's the horse tail energy storage. Like I basically simulate an exactly same size of uh, horse tail energy storage in South Australia. All right. So this is an actual production of horse tail energy, uh, horse tail power reserve. On the left hand side, we have stable price day, which is the, the red line is price uh, path. And on the right hand side, we have a volatile price day. Not surprisingly, energy storage production follows the prices very closely. So when energy storage production above zero, that means it's selling. When it's below zero, that means it's, it's buying. So as you can see, energy storage follows uh, the prices very closely and very sort of, a, we attribute it mostly because of the participation in ancillary services. Uh, but uh, so that sort of uh, tells, give, give us an, a little bit of idea about how to model an act, the hypothetical energy storage and how select there's the market. So to give you a little bit of sense of how energy storage changes the uh, social outcomes like consumer welfare in, in, this, in this model, uh, let's think about a very simple model where there's two, there are two periods, demand is lower in the first period and then higher in the second period. We have an aggregated supply curve, which is basically constructed by uh, <coughs> summing up all the bids from suppliers. And when energy storage enters the market, it's going to buy in first period. It's going to increase the demand, basically, in first period, and decrease demand in second period, and decrease prices in the second period. The way that energy storage uh, increases the consumer surplus is basically by uh, increasing, decreasing prices more in the second period. Why it's the case is because the residual demand is more elastic. So the energy market is more price sensitive when demand is high. So that when energy storage sells, when the prices are high, it's going to have a higher impact on prices. And when it's buying, when the demand is low, it's going to have lower impact on prices. That's why overall consumer surplus is going to increase when energy storage uh, engages in arbitrage. Okay, and because of the price variation change, the, right, because of the price change, the overall electricity prices are going to be smooth. Okay. So this is a picture about to the, kind of give you a little bit more uh, idea about the uh, identification strategy that I use to calculate supply function equilibriums here. So let's say for uh, some type of uh, signal, public signal, which you can think this is a, a weather forecast, uh, firms, estimate a distribution for net demand, which is the demand after renewable production for the whole day. So let's say this is an expected distribution of the net demand. So when you put energy storage on top of that, since energy storage smooths prices and since the prices are very close to correlated with demand, it's going to smooth demand as well, okay? So if we see some net demand distribution in our data that looks like that, we can use firm strategies, bids, in this case, as a best response to energy storage and find an equilibrium by using those strategies in the, in the, in the calculation, okay? So this is sort of, a, there are more, more nuances to that. There's a fixed point here that I'm not gonna go through, but this is sort of the basic idea of the identification strategy here. So using South Australian electricity market data, uh, you're all familiar with the, with the structure. So South Australia is very nice because this net demand is highly fluctuated uh, because of the wind generation. There's a high price volatility, which creates a nice environment for energy storage to engage in arbitrage. And there is also a market power concerns because this is, this is the market that highly concentrated, like three firms makes up almost 95% of the combustion generation. And not surprisingly, the largest lithium ion battery came online here in 2018. So I used data on forecast and relied demand prices, half hourly bids, forecast and realized renewable generation and industry cost of est industry estimates of cost and emissions. So I'm gonna write, go, do that, go down to the results. So I'm modeling a hypothetical standalone monopoly energy storage with 120 megawatt hour and 30 megawatt capacity, which is the part of the capacity of a Hornsdale power reserve that operated in that energy market, uh, rather than the frequency response market. With 85% run trip efficiency, uh, this capacity is, is around 10 to 2 to 10% of the net demand in South Australia. So it's quite big, but it's not so big that can smooth all the demand all the time, okay? and 
when we go through the results, I will show you that there's not going to be the incentive for energy just for to smooth everything down to the zero because then there will be no opportunity to make a profit because there will be no price experience there. So the Stangle energy storage impact, I uh, compare following cases. I first assume no price effect, then I assume a price effect, but firms do not respond to energy storage. Then I go into the fully integrated model where firms best response to energy storage, energy storage updates its strategies, then we find new equilibrium prices. So to, to see how those cases are a little bit different, so you can see here, this is, a, this is an energy storage price impact for a representative day in my data. So this black line is the original prices. Uh, when we allow for energy storage price impact, which is due to this production here, so when energy level goes up for energy storage, it means that it's buying, so it, it prices go up. And when it's go down, it's selling, prices go down, right? So here you can see that the, the red line, which is assuming that firms do not respond, but energy storage has a price impact, it smooths prices. And further down, if you allow for firms to best response, it smooths it even more, but not so much. So the difference is, is, is not a big deal. But this is why energy storage is probably not going, if you have uh, infinite capacity of energy storage, even that is not going to go all the way down because then if, if this price pad is, is, is smooth, then you can't really make revenue because there's no price variance basically. So when I compare these models uh, in terms of the revenue of energy storage and profit, so this is based on some estimated cost for energy storage for 20 years space. So 20 years probably a little bit high, we can play, play with that. We can decrease down to the 15, 10. Uh, so the revenue part is the, 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 the part that I estimated. So if you assume no price effect of energy storage and no price uncertainty, so this is a simple model where you get the given prices and operate energy storage, uh, then you make money. You make uh, quite a lot of money, but once you introduce price un uncertainty, it's going to go down to the zeros. So it's going to it's going to break even. I mean, you can improve this uh, this model. I use a certain type of model, simple model for energy storage operation. If you go crazy with reinforcement learning, etc., it can go uh, up as much as uh, like five here, which is is still not a big money uh, if you consider the cost is based on the twenty years. So if, if you go down to fifteen years, ten years, it's not going to cover it. Uh, and uh, once you introduce a price impact, the revenue is slashed in another 50% down. And this price effect is, is important because if, if you think about the larger energy storage that enters the market, that their, their profit is going to go down even further if we keep the energy mix fixed, okay? But while energy storage making no money, it's increasing consumer welfare more than the cost of energy storage. So why that's happening? It's because uh, while energy storage operates, it smooths prices and it increases consumer welfare and it's, it's more than the cost. So this is sort of a indicating that uh, energy storage can have a consumer welfare improvement impact. And if you're particularly concerned about consumers here in this market, you can subsidize energy storage to enter the market. But keep in mind that this is an energy storage that purely wants to maximize its profit. It's not, it's not have anything to do with the consumer welfare. So in the next uh, part of results, I considered different ownership structures. So the first one was the monopoly on energy storage, which is trying to just maximize its revenue. But then I considered the load on energy storage, which is an energy storage that's trying to maximize the consumer welfare impact of energy storage. So what that means is, energy storage wants to smooth prices and lower the prices as much as possible so that the cost of electricity acquisition for the consumer side is gonna go down, okay? Then I also consider the perfectly competitive energy storage market, which is like when you, when you have a monopoly energy storage, you have an incentive to underproduce because of your price impact. So here in this case, I basically assume that there is no uh, there's a price impact, but energy storage is not taking that into the consideration. So you can think this is a many small energy storages in the market working at the same time. So understand how that sort of 
impacts the operation of energy storage, let's look at the same representative day under different ownership structures. So you can see here the blue line is the same, but once you add a competitive, once you think about the competitive energy storage, it's actually uh, produced more. So monopoly energy storage has, uh, not surprisingly, uh, incentive to underproduce because of price impact. But if you look at the red line, which is the load on energy storage, it operates differently because it searches for periods where the price impact the highest because load on energy storage wants to minimize overall electricity acquisition costs for the, for the demand side. So here I'm basically comparing profits and the consumer surplus impact of this energy storage under different ownerships. And you can see that the monopoly energy storage increases consumer surplus, yes, but the low down one, which is the energy storage that trying to maximize the consumer surplus, is making a lot of improvements on that. So if you compare that with the cost, it's a substantial improvement. So it, here it says that there is sort of an underinvestment problem because energy storage doesn't make profit, but it increases the consumer surplus. So it's, it has an underinvestment problem if you're thinking about the uh, thinking about from consumer side. But even even in that case, there is an underutilization problem because monopoly energy storage is an incentive to to underproduce. It, it's not it's basically trying to maximize the, uh, its, its profit. So if you're thinking about the load side, if you're thinking about the consumer welfare, the mono, on, monopoly energy storage is going to underutilize its, 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 its technology. And so there are, the, the reason why we have this gap is there are two distortions here in prices. One is the market power of energy storage, and it, that can be solved by basically competitive energy storage. And you can see that the difference between competitive energy storage and monopoly energy storage is not large. So the distortion is mainly coming from other resources such as market power of incumbent firms. So this is the reason why uh, the, the, the reason why these two are different because incumbent firms bid differently in different times. And, and when they have market power, they basically uh, try to bid uh, much more than their cost. In terms of CO2 emissions, uh, Energy storage uh, mildly changes CO2 emissions, mildly decreasing CO2 emissions. And the reason why it's mildly decreasing is because, so there are two drivers about this result. Is one is the round trip efficiency. So energy storage basically wasting a little bit energy while it's operating. And that waste is coming from one energy resource that produces that electricity. So that sort of increases the CO2 emissions. But energy storage also, by changing electricity production in time, shifting energy production in time, changes the CO2 efficiency of the, of the marginal units in different times. So when energy storage buys, if it buys from a low CO2 emission uh, generator, it can, and when it sells, if the marginal uh, unit that energy storage replaces has a higher CO2 emissions rate, it can lower the emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, by shifting that. So it's basically doing that. It's in this monopoly energy storage we had at uh, 120 megawatt hour capacity decreases CO2 emissions by 3,000 ton, uh, which is, which is uh, it's not a lot, but it's, 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 it's basically a little bit uh, decrease. But uh, this is a little bit different than the existing uh, results in the literature, which mostly found that the energy storage actually increasing CO2 emissions. That's mostly because of the generation mix and marginal unit differences. So here in South Australia, cheaper units usually have uh, lower CO2 emissions uh, because of the, the, the efficiency of the gas power plants. It's probably different in Victoria and different regions, but in South Australia, that was the case. In terms of the impact on incumbents, so as I said, energy storage wastes a little bit of energy and that energy is mostly produced by natural gas generators. Uh, but even, even though the natural gas generators production increases, their revenues decreases because of the price impact. And as you can see that the uh, renewables are getting the highest hit because they can't really adjust their production in time. That's why when the uh, average price decreases, their revenue is also decreasing. And in terms of the, how renewables and energy storage interacts, I did the following exercise. I basically doubled the wind capacity in South Australia 
then double the solar capacity and see how energy storage improves consumer welfare and the revenue of renewables in that case, compared to the baseline case in which energy storage basically enters the existing uh, South Australian market. So wind generation capacity increases substantially here. It goes from 40 to 80, but solar is going 10 from, uh, from 10 to 20. So this is mostly uh, a rooftop solar PV. And so here in baseline case, you can see that uh, the renewable get hurt by energy storage. And there are two tri drivers for that impact. One is, as I said, change in average prices. But the second is a correlation of renewable production and prices. So if you have uh, renewable production from wind uh, close to 40%, then prices, the chances are high that the prices are going to be lower when the wind revenue, wind generation is the, is, is the highest. So that's why energy storage usually buys around uh, that period where the renew, uh, renewable energy is, is more than the prices are going up, but it sells when the prices, uh, when prices are high and renewable generation is, is less. But Overall, this average price impact, it's going to dominate. But when you have more wind, that is going to increase the price variation because the wind availability changes in time. And that's going to improve energy storage profit. It's also going to improve consumer surplus. And it's mostly due to decrease in curtailment. So energy storage is going to help uh, renewables as well by decreasing this curtailment and increasing the revenue of, of renewables. For solar, it's not so much the case uh, because solar production is, is usually highly correlated with existing prices already. Uh, but keep in mind that this is for like small improvement uh, in solar capacity. So if you go above like 40%, 50%, 60%, the picture can change and we might have different results. But for this existing one, and also keep in mind that this is an energy storage that is not owned by the renewable side. So this is an energy storage basically operates as a merchant monopoly energy storage so that there is no synergy between energy storage and renewables here. Uh, and in that case, as I said, renewables are hurt in the base case. But when you have more renewables, they can be improved. The revenue can be improved even when energy storage operates independently. So as a summary for this paper, I build up a model to quantify a hypothetical energy storage's impact, and I find two welfare improve, possible welfare improvement policy from the consumer side that there's an under uh, investment for, for energy storage because it's not profitable, but, but it's consumer welfare improving. And even, even if you subsidize a particular owner to enter the market, they're going to underutilize that because prices are the right, right incentives to. to operate that energy storage efficiently from the consumer side. So there's an ownership discussion as well. And I also find that an independent energy storage does not really support renewables when there's no curtailment. Okay, for the next case, uh, I did a 30 minutes calculation. So this was the end of my paper. Now I'm going to speculate about different uh, uh, policies for energy storage and different needs for energy storage. So in this exercise, I, uh, I basically spent 30 minutes in which I took 2019 renewable generation profiles from four, gen uh, four regions, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, and New South Wales. And I invest as much as the peak system demand of NIM, which is around 36 gigawatt, for each of the wind and solar production profiles for each state. So that means 36 gigawatt times eight. So this is an immense capacity that I uh, basically injected the system. Sorry, not injected the system, but use these as the baseline, uh, renewable baseline energy generation. So this is sort of under, to understand if you're thinking about 100% renewable, uh, can, we, can we really reach there? And if you reach there, how much energy storage that we might need? <laughs> so here in these two graphs, we have wind data profile, wind production data profiles for different states and solar data profiles for different states. So you can see that there's a, uh, in Queensland, the wind production, the, the wind capacity is not high in the, I think it, it's increased a little bit in 2019, but don't mind that. So there is a high correlation in wind generation in all the regions, Victoria, South Australia, and Queensland. And there's a high correlation in solar across the board, 
which is the same in many parts of the world, the solar preview production is usually highly correlated. So in the simulations, basic simulations, there are days with almost no wind and solar production in the whole system for a day. So that means you need, you need to maintain, maintain the overall system's load demand in those days, which is around 100 and 200 gigawatt hour of capacity. So you need to have at least 100 and 200 uh, gigawatt of capacity of storage to maintain this short term balance if you were gonna wanna go crazy and 100, have 100% 100 renewable with existing generations, existing renewable generations that you have, okay? And there is also seasonal uh, differences in terms of production. Again, don't mind the Queensland, it's, it's, it's an new investment. Uh, so there's a small seasonal variation in wind, uh, but in solar, there's a large seasonal variation. So you need at least one to two terawatt hour of cheap energy storage to shift this renewable generation between seasons. You, can, you don't need to have a fancy, uh, energy storage, it could, it could have like 50% <laughs> efficiency, 40% efficiency. The key is you need to have a cheap energy storage because for with lithium ion batteries, you can't really have one or two terawatt hour of capacity because like at the moment, the, the current capacity, the production capacity is I think around one to two terawatt hour overall in the world. And the EVs are on the line and like other type of needs for lithium ion batteries are on the line. So I don't think lithium ion battery is going to be the only answer to, to deal with the seasonal differences. So we need to have other uh, type of uh, energy storage technologies to, to fix this uh, renewable uh, shift, so renewable availability in time. Or we need to basically find another source of uh, energy production, uh, maybe like uh, nuclear or some other, other ways. Okay. So now I will talk a little bit about the policies that can improve energy storage participation. One, I think most of these are already being considered by the NIM and different authorities in Australia, which is, our, which, our, which is great because this is definitely an improvement. Um, like nodal pricing is, is, is of course a better signal for future investment because uh, like you have, if you actually, if you, you have transmission constraints in, in the, the actual dispatch of the energy, uh, and there are some sun, side payments going on, opaque side payments, uh, it's better to have a clear signal of uh, just nodal prices to have a better, uh, for, the, for the actual future investments on the different parts of the, of the grid. Uh, but of course the concern is there is a potential market power because, excuse me, if you are in a mostly congested pocket, you have a larger market power, but Again, there are methods to, to deal with that and data market is definitely can help with that uh, as well. So five minute settlement, again, a better signal for adjustments. And if you have a nodal pricing and if you don't have five minute settlement, if you have 30 minute settlement, that's probably not gonna work uh, nicely, not gonna have a great results as you would have with the five minute settlement. So you definitely need that. Uh, with nodal pricing. So again, there's a potential market power concerns, like you, there, there could be uh, behavior, uh, uncompetitive behavior of uh, energy, pro uh, energy producers that basically increase electricity production in time so that uh, some uh, energy resources that is not as adjustable as that is drop out of the market so that they can ramp up the prices. Uh, but again, the market can help with that as well. Uh, demand side participation. This is not just for energy storage. It can, it, it will, it will improve. Uh, it can improve uh, efficiencies in the, in, the, in the demand response. So we definitely need that in the future for sure, because uh, demand side participation is is key. Maybe not uh, uh, sort of a, uh, from the household's perspective, but maybe from the utilities that can provide some efficient, uh, some pro provide some demand side participation by DREs or some aggregators uh, as well. So contingent bidding for energy storage, which is to say that energy storage can be able to bid uh, conditional on the energy level that they have in their, in their uh, battery. It's probably not so much needed now because this is like, we don't, you don't have a day at market at, at the moment. 
but with the dead market the contingent bidding is definitely required because otherwise an after storage might not be able to participate uh, one that might not be able to produce because their energy level might change and with the dual optimization and frequency response market and energy market it's going to be give even more complicated so the contingent bidding is definitely needed for energy storage so other commands um, i know that the for sale electric uh, power reserve makes a lot of money from FCAS and that's actually sliced uh, the, the overall uh, costs of FCAS by half, but that's good source of income for now. It's definitely going to evaporate if you have six gigawatt hour of capacity of energy storage, that market is tiny compared to the energy market. So uh, I don't think we can rely on FCAS going forward for energy storage. And average cost for grid scale energy storage doesn't really decrease much after the size of five to 10. So we don't really have to have 100 megawatt hour of uh, energy storage, 500 megawatt hour of energy storages. There could be small, many energy storages in, 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 in different parts of the grid. And with the normal pricing, it's better to have small energy storages in different parts of the grid because it can deal with the transmission congestion as well, which is the, one of the projects that I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. And energy source can also pro produce, provide some other products like renewables, replacing fossil fuels and fossil fuel generators can, was, was already providing some like spinning reserve and other kinds of products that they were willing to uh, produce because it's not so, so much uh, huddle for them, but energy source can also uh, give that service, uh, which is, could be a complement for renewables. So I have, uh, let me check my time. Okay, 15 minutes. Let me go over this in two minutes. So uh, I'm working on a question of like how electricity market regulations can be updated. They allow for fair and efficient energy storage entry in PJM. So in PJM, the, the main re re revenue streams are capacity markets, ancillary services, energy markets, and transmission relief. So energy storage can provide the transmission relief if there's a transmission line uh, the congested transmission line is not congested all the time and if there are some uh, like if it congested every now and then then you don't really need to improve that line because the transmission line improvements actually cost more than the, the new lines in, in some cases so by putting up energy storage in congested pocket side can help but you need to have the right payments for energy storage to participate in that product and energy storage doesn't have to participate in it fully it doesn't have to dedicate all production and transmission relief it can basically uh, operate in the electric market but you need to give the right incentives for energy storage to to play play the, the, the transmission relief in the right way because in the transmission congestion game energy storage has a higher market power okay and the rel uh, uh, excuse me Another relevant questions that can answer by this with toolbox is which technology aspect is better of energy storage in, in these type of markets and where, where on the grid we should put energy storage and what are the market power concerns for energy storage, especially when we introduce this transmission congestion product. So I'm also working on a impact of large EV charge demand. I know that Australia is not one of the, 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 the biggest uh, EV uptakers in the world, but I know that they're ambitious to have more. So I'm asking, so this large EV uptake can cause further demand spikes. It could be horrible for the, for the grid, but it can also provide demand flexibility depending on the system. So after the question of like, what is the value of coordination here? So basically gonna compare three different cases. One is business as usual. Let's say we have a large EV fleet. They go to the work and they charge at the work. They come back home, charge at the home what would be the impact of that the extra load uh, on the power grid uh, in terms of prices and in terms of the capacity requirements. And then I go over the simple coordination case, which is sort of a simply saying the people who go to the work that, or having a sort of automated system that can smooth that load within the day or at night, maybe smooth the, smooth the demand of EV uh, then I go for the fully engaged in the, uh, arbitrage case where EVs can sell back to the grid uh, when the energy prices are higher. And this can be done by uh, like 
maybe a little bit complicated uh, kind of uh, uh, deals with the with the uh, energy uh, the EV charging station owners uh, also requires a lot of uh, infrastructure for sure. But we are after the the value of coordination. If it's worth it, maybe we should do it. So the the impact of these cases on emissions, market prices, and market power. So there are some implications about the value of aggregators participation and for utilities. There are implications about the, what are the retail prices that we should have for, for EV charging stations and for the station owners, what would be the business plan and coupling these products and services. So I'm currently talking to a utility in Australia about the uh, ongoing, I think it's already begun, ongoing experimental EV demand, which is sponsored by Arena. Uh, so I'm hoping to work a little bit more uh, in Australian market. And uh, so if we expecting 10 million EV, 10 million EVs, that can provide us one terawatt hour of sitting energy storage capacity, which uh, might be one way to deal with this uh, short run fluctuations. Uh, but we need to automate that for sure. All right, thank you very much. All right, Great, Omar, thank you so very much. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, if you have access to the Q&A box, maybe you can take a look at them. Um, or do you need me to read them out to you? I can read them out loud and try to answer them. Yeah, right. So I think there's a few questions and a few comments. Um, I think, you know, exercise your own discretion to decide what you want to answer. And what uh, we don't have time to answer for today, we can uh, we can do this in writing and post it on the website as we did before. Okay, so now I'm gonna answer in the way that they came. So, uh, in an anonymous attendee asks, have you included uh, any total life cycle costing on energy storage types into your modeling? So I did a couple of exercises in which I assumed uh, one like one type of a, uh, like a cost for each cycle and. I tried to do a couple of different things about the lifetime of energy storage. One thing that I didn't do is uh, like when you enter, when you charge energy storage fully and discharge fully, that affects energy storage's lifetime. I didn't do much about that, so it's not a linear uh, degradation basically. Uh, but that total life cycle costing changes things a little bit, but not not so much. So Ariel Lipman asks, why doesn't energy storage behavior uh, change under firm response to scenario relative to the no response scenario? It changes a little bit. It doesn't change so much. The reason why it doesn't change so much is that uh, energy storage is, even though it's uh, it's big enough, it's it's not so big. So uh, the the only difference why the, the the reason why firms responding to energy storage is because change in their market power since this this supply function includes any uh, levels of energy production that they can provide so theoretically it should be like uh, basically the marginal cost curve if there's no market power so if there's no market power there's no need to respond but here in south australia there's a little bit market power and that graph sort of shows us that uh, the the, the price impact of firm's price response is not so much because energy storage actually reacts to that as well. So in the equilibrium, we uh, find that the prices are not so well off uh, compared to the case where it's don't, no response. So there's a, there's a long comment there that I'm going to cast aside if that's all right with you, Omer. There's a, if you scroll further down, there's a question by David Prince on um, uh, market design effectively. Okay, so David Prince asks, if the maximizing consumer welfare diminishes profit, does that mean the rules are not uh, working properly? Should not the rules work on the, so that energy storage incentives are aligned with the consumer welfare? So this is, uh, uh, it, the consumer welfare doesn't really diminish the profit, but the, so let's think about the case where everyone bids the same thing uh, all the time because there's no market power. In that case, the energy storage's op uh, energy storage production uh, will not change under different ownership structures because energy storage basically going will, will go up and down in that uh, aggregated supply curve. 
So the reason why energy store, why the, the consumer welfare, uh, when the, in the case where the consumer welfare is the highest, the profit is not the highest, is the uh, market power of income, uh, market power of the incumbent firms, because they bid differently in different times. So energy storage faces different uh, aggregate supply curves rather than the same one. That's the reason why uh, it's not aligned. Uh, but other than that, so the rules are, so when you, when you have a market power, you will have this difference uh, for sure. And the, the completely ruling out market power is going to have different implications. Uh, so rules are working, but there are some distortions in the markets. Uh, all right, uh, so Darren Miller asks, if arbitrage revenues are insufficient to, to see sufficient energy storage built, uh, do we need to uh, need some sort of a capacity payments to make up the difference? They are making uh, sort of a cap. It's it's not capacity payments, but most of the energy storage uh, investments in the electricity market seems to be supported by either the federal government or the state government. So most most of the proposed projects are also uh, get these type of benefits from the government. So I would say. Like, I know the capacity payments are kind of a different way to go in the market design for, uh, for electricity markets. But I think this is uh, like, if it's already, it's going on, you're already paying it. Why not have the market to find the efficient, most efficient solution? Uh, so I would go for, I would, I would say that having some sort of capacities or like whatever you call it, you can call it a, uh, resource adequacy requirements, etc. Having a market for that, I think it's going to improve the efficiency. And like South Australian government is paying around two million Australian dollars to uh, the horse sale, so they're paying it. None, none, of, none of these energy stores are entering uh, as a merchant on their own. So. Let me, okay, John Sibley asks, can you please further explain the load on operational model? Is it operating behind the meter or across the market as a financial hedge? So it's a great question. So when I talk about load on, it's, it's uh, so load here is a kind of an abstract concept where you can think this is a whole demand side. So it's not a household, it's not behind the meter. Uh, but it's the whole demand, whole demand side. So it's sort of an overall electricity acquisition cost of the market. Uh, so what energy storage does in a load on operational case, it's minimize, it's trying to minimize that. So it's trying to minimize overall electricity production. It's not a minimizing electricity production cost, it's minimizing electricity acquisition cost. So it might have implications further down the line for households, where like if you, if you change, if, if average prices go down, then utilities will probably have uh, lower rates and that can have implications uh, further down the line. But this is not from the household's perspective. This is from uh, some abstract load uh, entity perspective. All right, so Brian Spark asks for seasonal storage, have you looked at or include significant overbuilding of solar and wind generation to deal with seasonal variants? Uh, does this reduce the amount of energy storage required and impact prices? So as, as I've said, uh, in, in my 30 minutes exercise, I basically overbuilt everything. So the, the peak demand in this, uh, all of the NIM, NIM system is around 36 gigawatt hour. I'm, I'm excluding Tasmania uh, and I'm also excluding Western Australia. But uh, so basically I invest on 36, times eight, so it's an overbuild. So the reason why we need uh, to deal with this uh, seasonal difference and like short run differences, there are days that the wind and solar is not available. Even if you invest all of the uh, potential uh, products, potential, line, potential lands in, 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 the, in the area, since the renewable production is correlated across the country for wind and solar, you're not going to have a significant difference. And in terms of seasonal variation, uh, I don't think the, the cost of 
storage is going to be larger than the, the cost of renewable that we need to deal with the seasonal variance uh, because like one to three terawatt hour capacity is not large compared to the doubling the investment of 36 times eight gigawatt hour of capacity of renewable. It's compared to that, it's going to be cheaper. So for seasonal variance, I think there will be some, hopefully there will be some technology that we're gonna uh, use and uh, it's going to be cheap enough so that uh, we won't have to deal, we, we won't have to deal with the overinvestment in renewables. So another question from David Hyatt, it's Khan asks, have you thought of modeling combining welfare effects with the CO2 effects putting the shadow price of CO2. So as I said, the CO2 is, uh, the CO2 impact is not so large. So if you think about this like hundreds Australian dollars or like uh, more than that 150 Australian dollars, it still doesn't change much. Uh, the reason for, for that is at the moment, the marginal unit CO2 emissions, are, the difference is not so large. Uh, so when energy storage buys, that the marginal unit's production increases when the price is low and the CO2 emission of that unit is not so different than when, the, <coughs> excuse me, when energy storage sells. So overall CO2 emission impact is, is not going to be so much important at the moment, but it will be important when we start to see more curtailment. So when energy storage decreases curtailment, that's, is the, that will be the case where the CO2 emission impact is going to be even important, more important. So I think for energy storage in the short run, CO2 emission impact is, is probably, uh, CO2 emission impact is probably not going to uh, rationalize the, the investment for it. So Guillaume, how we, are we, how we are doing on time? I think we probably should uh, thank you and bring this to a close. I think there's uh, a couple more questions that are yet uh, unanswered, but uh, what we'll do is, uh, we draw, we draw them out of the system and uh, send them to you for comments. If that's okay with you, so we'll we'll consume another fifteen minutes of your time to answer those questions, uh, but offline. So, uh, uh, if people were in attendance, I'm sure they would clap. So, but thank you very much for addressing us, especially at this time of the night for you in in Turkey. We very much look forward to more of your work, and I'm very happy to hear that you engage with other projects right here in Australia. Uh, and we'll make sure that uh, we get you more of the data that, uh, that you mm -hmm. work so well with. So thanks very much. Thank you to the audience for uh, joining us today. And I will be in touch with you, Omer, I'm sure, um, in the very near future. Thanks again. Yeah, I, will, I will be more than in, uh, further engaging. Thank you. Thanks, Omer. Thanks. This was great. And thanks, everybody, for attending the webinar. I uh, hope you all uh, learned a lot. Bye.